Um, let's get started. So, uh, so welcome everyone. Um, so welcome to Ruby Tuesday at JavaScript Connect number 10. Um, <coughs> probably, probably brought to you by, um, we have KL Ruby Remix, um, JavaScript Malaysia, um, Connect at NY, Ruby Malaysia Meetup page. If you are um, in the Meetup group, you can RSVP and we have Slack, so you can invite yourself if you are Ruby guy. Um, this is the Wi Fi access, so if you need Wi Fi, here's the password. I'm good, okay. So, um, we also thank our sponsor ACAT for uh, providing us the venue. Uh, so, uh, I'm Gui, I'm the organizer of Ruby Tuesday and Just Read Up. So, um, I see some new faces here. So, anyone, this is their first time. Might introduce yourself. I'm Keith Bennett. Um, I'm American, but I live in Chiang Mai, Thailand most of the time. I'm here to escape the terrible air pollution that they're having right now, uh, which I was expecting to do anyway, but it's way worse this year than last year. So um, I've been here for a couple of weeks. I'll probably be here for a few more weeks. Where are you from? Uh, the USA. Uh, my hometown is New York City, but in more recent years, I've lived in the Washington D.C. suburbs. Okay. So, how many resides in Penang? I'm sorry? You currently resides in Vienna? Well, temporarily, yeah. For a few weeks. Hi, so I'm here, so I'm from Vienna. <laughs> from Vienna. And then, uh, currently running a digital branding agency. So we're doing a digital marketing branding, and as well as we're doing training and coaching for small, medium enterprises. Like currently, this year, we are planning to go into more of a corporate uh, kind of level kind of uh, project and uh, we do development as well so we need freelancers or part timers uh. okay so uh, that's an uh, password that's the next guy who's okay hi i'm john ali from connect 23 and i am the virtual program that's what we need to make thank you there i can see so what's the <laughs> you want everyone to introduce or only the, the new guys? guys? Yeah. Okay, the new guys to introduce. Okay, uh, my name is Aaron. It's uh, uh, local uh, Penang Josh Town. Yeah. Okay. So um, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so this is the uh, <laughs> talks that we'll be having. We have Ruby tracks, JavaScript tracks, and whatever tracks it means. If you have anything that's outside of Ruby and JavaScript. Feel free to submit your talks. So let's start with functional programming in Ruby by Keith. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm really aware that my accent is very different from most of yours. And if you have a hard time understanding me, please like do something to catch my attention. Because the worst thing would be if you guys just sat there bored, having no idea what I'm talking about. Probably we need some titles of that. Subtitles? <laughs> That's an idea. That's what the slides are for. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm going to go full screen mode here, I think. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, tell me, who here is a Rubyist, works with Ruby? Okay, just two people. And everyone else, JavaScript? Uh, any other languages? Sharp, LJS. Okay, so <clears throat> JavaScript is the only language that might remotely be considered functional, I guess, of those languages, right? Um, and Ruby is kind of a, can be a functional language, but typically it's never been used that way. Anyway, um, disclaimer, I am not a functional programming expert. I've played a little bit with some languages, um, and I've played a lot with Ruby in, in functional ways. Uh, Lambda is a free-floating function. It's a function that it doesn't, it's not attached to a class or an object. Uh, functions are considered first-class objects in a functional language, meaning they can be passed around at will, they can appear anywhere that any other language construct can appear. Um, so if you have a local variable and there's something in it, there could be a Lambda uh, that that local variable, variable refers to and you can just Pass it around just like any other object. Another analogy would be it's like a string literal. 
you know, you can just do anything with it pretty much. And by enabling functions that return values, you create the opportunity to build highly dynamic and adaptable systems, which we'll see an example of later. So for the Rubyists, do you remember when you started Ruby and you first encountered code blocks? They were confusing to me. I don't know about you guys, but um, we persevered, we mastered them. And of course, it was worth the effort, right? Because um, because code blocks are any amount of Ruby anyway, you, you need to understand what they are. But also, they're very useful as well. Well, lambdas are the next step in that progression. Code blocks are like code literals, and lambdas are objects that contain code. And um, they're, they're similar. And the reason I, I say this is because a lot of people look at lambdas as being something way out there, and something totally different, and something of another dimension. When um, in reality they're they're not, and, and sometimes when people consider lambdas so distant, it's kind of a reason not to use them and not to learn about them, um, and that's for me I feel it's um, unfortunate. A lot of times uh, when I've tried to introduce lambdas in code, people have complained, "Well, it's not idiomatic Ruby. I haven't seen it before. I don't understand it. I don't really want to learn it, so don't use them." Right? Um, but. My position is that the benefits of using lambdas are so compelling that they justify deviating from idiomatic Ruby and even changing idiomatic Ruby so it becomes idiomatic Ruby. There are many benefits of using lambdas. In general, we develop systems. Whatever language we're using, we're developing systems. And even if we weren't developing software, we might be developing other kinds of systems. In all systems, unnecessary complexity is our enemy, right? We're always trying to, uh, to maximize the ratio of function functionality over complexity. We want a lot of functionality, but we want to use as little complexity as necessary to get there. Why do we use local variables? To limit their scope, right? Well, what's the value of that? Anybody? Memory? Memory. Yeah, I, I guess because it's they're living on the stack and yeah. then when the function's finished. Yeah, they're down there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you're encapsulating that variable so that it, the scope doesn't leak out to other code that doesn't need it. Right? And um, it improves the simplicity of the code because of that and also the reliability. Um, obviously, we want to limit scope as much as possible. It makes things simpler, right? And, I mean, it's kind of a, something that we. It's intuitive to us already, it's natural, we know that, right? So why don't we do that with code? Why are we doing that with data? Now, we kind of do it with code because we do have classes. But I don't know about the code that you've seen, but the, the kind of code that, that I've worked with um, in the various jobs I've had often has been large classes of many methods. And um, when there are so many methods, it's kind of confusing. So here is one measure of complexity that, that might show how dramatic the number of methods uh, really is in contributing to complexity. The number of possible paths of interaction between instance methods is equal to n times the quantity n minus 1, or n is the number of methods. Right? So here we have five methods, and we have an index of 20. Okay? Now, let's say, for example, that two of those methods are only used by one other method. Okay, let's say, for example, there's a constructor, and it's having to do stuff, and two of the methods are just doing stuff that the constructor is calling, it's needing. So, why aren't we doing the same thing that we might do with variables, making them local? Right? If we do, we can reduce the complexity from 20 down to 6, which is less than a third of the original complexity index. So here, um, this, these m's are method, and the, the, the lambda is lambda. And so um, this is kind of a clue as to how we're going to accomplish those inner methods. Um, they, I mean, yes, they interact with this method, and so there's this amount of complexity, but it's very, very small. But now we only have three methods, and there are only six possible paths of interaction. So here's an example of using lambdas as local nested functions. Many years ago, I worked with Pascal. Uh, just to, to learn it. And um, 
Pascal has nested methods. And I was really impressed. As soon as I saw them, I thought, this is great, this is wonderful. And as my career progressed, and I went through all these other languages, and C and C++ and Java and, and, and even Ruby, um, they were nowhere to be seen. And one time I asked Mots at a conference, I, I saw him in the hallway, and I said, hey Mots, I got a great idea. Let's add nested methods to Ruby. He said, interesting, put it in the issue tracker. And so that evening I went to a Birds of a Feather session, and Mots was there, and he said, you know, when people suggest an idea that I have no intention of implementing, I tell them, put it in the issue tracker. <laughs> so I don't think we're gonna see nested methods in Ruby. Um, anyway, here's an example. We have um, we have these lambdas here, and I mean the, the names are bad names, but but the, the idea is that we have we're dividing the code into smaller pieces and naming those pieces, right? And then at the end we're tying it all together and calling all of those lambdas. So look at the structure of the code. Does it look like anything else? Another programming construct to you that you can think of? Python? 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 Class structure. Class structure. It's like a class. Why is it like a class? Because you have a you have an outer thing that's packaging it. You have inner named chunks of code. And um, uh, and and if you organize your code in this way, and you want to create a class from it, it's just a matter of changing some of the syntax. All the organization is already there, right? And this is what it might look like. You have a class with the same name, and then we have these methods, and then it's a little bit different because we have a run method, and, and then we, we call it like this. So very often what I'll do in my code is I'll write a method, and if the method starts getting longer and more complex, I'll divide it into lambdas. And then if it gets really complex, I'll say, okay, now it's time to make this thing a class, and then I make it into a class. Um, and it's very easy to do. In contrast with the approach that most other people I spoke with, which is they will just put everything everywhere and say, well, if it gets too complicated, I'll refactor it into a class. But they never have time to do it because the cost of doing it is so high because they didn't prepare by already having the code in organized chunks, the way this approach does it. So I recommend that even if you don't want to use lambdas, um, uh, to, to start out, to try it. You know, if, if you have some complex piece of code, um, make lambdas, and then um, later you can turn it into a class, or if you want, you can just unwrap all the lambdas and lamb the code all together. But I suspect that once you start doing this, um, you might find that it, it makes your code cleaner. Um, here's another example of a lambda as a nested function. Um, very often, or from time to time, I have the, the need to format text in the same way, multiple times, in the same method. It's always been, you know, a complicated, well, how do I do this? I want the code to be dry, so maybe I just make the format string and specify the format string in one place, because I'm using printf style formatting here. You all know what that is? It comes from C language, and it, okay. So I do a lot of text mode um, command line utilities, and that's the only way you convert a, a horizontally aligned text is, is using something like printf. And so it's very useful for me. And anyway, um, if if you are willing to use a lambda for this, then it simplifies it pretty much as much as you possibly could. I think um, we have a format lambda here, which takes the caption this and the value this. And um, it formats it, returns a formatted string with those values. And then all you have to do is call the format lambda like this. Now, if this were an instance method, it would be somewhere out there, somewhere else in the class. You'd have to look to find it. And if you were scanning the instance methods in the class, you wouldn't really know like who uses this thing. But if it's inside the method, you know that that's the only thing using it. There's no way any code outside of that method can access it, right? By the way, interrupt me if you have any questions or comments. Um, so I found this approach super, super useful, and this is the kind of string that it will produce. Um, 
Recently, I've been working on a, a gem called Rex, R-E-X-E, -E, which um, helps you execute Ruby on the command line. And one of the things I, I'm always complaining about command line utilities that don't let you um, easily um, get their output in machine readable formats like JSON or YAML. You know, so many command line utilities, they print this stuff that's human readable, but if you need to do something with it, you have to parse it. I did a lot of work at VeriSign in helping the testing team test command line utilities and stuff uh, for networking. And um, they were constantly, in their tests, having to read the output of commands and parse it into something, some objects in memory. And I'm thinking, why is this necessary? This should not be a problem. And so in this, and also my Wi-Fi One um, program, I decided that I was going to put my money where my mouth is and um, support formatting in, in several ways. So this is extracted from that source code. This is a hash of whose keys are um, format names or labels, and whose values are lambdas. Yes? Yeah, I'll keep it sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. The word lookup means this particular function is going through each and every part of the JSON format and they read the information out from the JSON file or? No, no. no. Um, well, let, let me go on and, and, and ask me again if you still have the question in a couple of minutes, okay? Because I'll explain how this works. So, um, uh, we're using this as at formatter, so we're just initializing this once. So when this method is called, uh, at formatter should be nil. And so it'll execute this, and it'll assign this hash to this instance variable. And then the next time around, it won't need to, so it won't. So basically, this method is just returning a hash, which is a lookup table of format types and um, behaviors which implement those formats. So to take your example of JSON, uh, if you were to pass if you say formatters, square brackets, colon JSON, um, you would get this lambda here. Now this is, um, all of these lambdas, in order to make these behaviors interchangeable, they have to take the same thing and return the same thing, pretty much. So they all have one parameter, an object, they're free, taken in, and they're all returning a string. Well, except for the none, which returns nil. But basically, um, they're almost all returning strings. And so um, if I were to instead uh, pass in pretty JSON as a symbol, I would get this lambda, which does the pretty JSON, which is on multiple lines and much nicer. Uh, or if I pass in awesome print, I would get the lambda, which would output it as awesome print. So I don't know about you, but the implementations I, I would produce and what I've seen before this approach were like way, way more complicated and verbose in this. So this was this is an epiphany for me, I'm really glad. And um, uh, if we have time, I can show you later how um, when you specify an option on the command line, it kind of translates into this thing and how it's actually used to output the text. Are we okay? Any more questions? Okay. Um, and similarly, parsing is the same way. Well, you know, if, if I want this utility to be able to output in various formats, how about inputting in various formats? So um, when um, this uh, program takes its input, if you have specified that the input will be coming in in YAML format, then it will um, parse that YAML format for you so that in your piece of source code, you can refer to the parsed object itself. You don't have to um, parse it yourself or there's no work to do, it's, it's really cool. And in fact, I'll, I'll just show you uh, briefly um, so here's the uh, okay. okay. So here I'm I'm downloading some uh, currency exchange rates, putting them in an environment variable, and uh, if I echo it, you'll see that it's in JSON mode. And um, what I can do is I can echo this and pipe it to Rex, and I can say this is coming in as JSON, okay? And um, I'm going to output it as um, let's say yeah. And I have to give it the, the mode that is coming in as one big string and not multiple lines and stuff. So I give it the MD, and I get YAML. Or if I instead want uh, awesome print, I get that. So it's, it's really very handy. And um, 
Uh, yeah, so we can input and output the three formats. Um, threads. Now, threads are also a, a place where lambdas can be useful because when you initialize a thread object, you pass it the code that you want it to ex execute. Um, and here's a case where I have lambdas. I mean, this, this could also be a method name, but, um, but you may want to use lambdas instead. Um, uh, so we've seen some examples of it, but let's go back to the, the beginning of the, the syntax. Um, there were several changes made from version 1.8 of, of Ruby to 1.9. 1.8 um, and before, there was only one way to specify the lambda, and that was with this notation here. And uh, starting 1.9, you had an additional way of specifying lambdas, which was this, which I call the stabby lambda, but everyone else calls the stabby proc, even though it produces a lambda. I don't know. Naming is important for me, so <laughs> I call it a stabby lambda. Um, and uh, here is a lambda who takes parameters. Um, and uh, as you can see, the syntax is very similar, almost actually exactly the same as a block. And uh, this is the brackets syntax, this is the do man syntax. Um, pretty straightforward. And the alternate syntax for creating a lambda uh, has you specifying the parameters as if it were a method signature, um, as if it were a method definition. Lambdas are assignable, obviously. Um, we can, yeah, puzzle book. Is there something I said that was confusing? No, okay. <laughs> if you do, let me know. Um, so here we have a lambda. Oh, sorry, I can't click on that. Um, we have a lambda that takes a name as a parameter and it's just returning a string with that name embedded in it. And we're assigning that whole thing to the local variable named greeter. And uh, so with that, we can call it in different ways. Uh, all lambdas have the call method defined, which is kind of like the basic way to call them. And, and this is a very strange discovery for me, and I'm not sure why that this was done, but if you don't want to use dot call, you can use square brackets, which is an alias for dot call. And I thought to myself, if anybody on my team tries to do that, I'm going to shoot them. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But, um, but I thought, wow, that would be really confusing if I saw that and I found out that thing on the left of the square brackets was a lambda. Why would you possibly do that? And I still think that, except that I did find one case where that was appropriate, which I'll show you later. Uh, and starting with 1.9, uh, you can use the dot for end notation. Lambdas are closures, which means that they take with them the environment in which they were created. So here's an example of where we have a variable, n equals 15, and inside the lambda, we say puts in, and here's an example, by the way, of where we're creating a lambda and calling it in line at the same time, not even assigning it to a variable. This says 15. You could pass this lambda somewhere totally out there in the, the process's memory and some other class instance is holding onto it, and it was still output 15 because it's carrying its context with it. Sometimes this is not a good thing, because it also means that somewhere out there that has, is holding out to that lambda, they can modify the environment back here, uh, which might not be what you want. Um, so here's an example of where, before we were just reading the variable, here we're assigning a new value to it. And um, so now when we output n, it has a new value, which is not, possibly would not other code is expected, unless you're careful. And, and that is one of the, differences between having the multiple lambdas in a function in a method and having methods in a class. Because if you define variables um, in a method containing lambdas, those methods would be available to subsequent lambdas that are defined in that method. And so that can be a good thing, but it can also make your code kind of sloppy. So be careful about that. Um, bindings. Bindings provide even more of an opportunity and a risk to modifying the variables external to the lambda. Um, <clears throat> because you can call eval on a binding. Does everybody know what a binding is? A binding is something that holds on to um, the context of, of, of the code that you're in. So I'll show you if we go to IRB, uh, and binding is actually a method call which returns a binding. 
And if I, the class is binding, and if I ask the class, what are your instance methods defined by you and not your super classes, it'll show these are the, uh, actually I should use books maybe. And while I'm at it, I'll sort it. Okay. So um, it, you can get your local variables, you can set local variables, uh, you can see if they're defined. You can get a source location, which is kind of interesting. Um, and in, um, in IRB, it's not really that interesting because it's just IRB. And, yeah. By the way, self um, in IRB is an instance of object whose name is main. <coughs> That'll be useful later. Remember that prime prime uses binding to. Yes, prime. yes, yes, it's yes. And a lot of people don't realize that that binding can be anything. It could be anything. Like if I. Um, um, Let's do this. Uh, if I can, I can say file.cry, and then methods. So these are all the, the file methods. So now the file class is your context. Yeah, but yeah. <coughs> okay. Lambda locals. <coughs> the problem about overwriting uh, variables in the scope of the lambda can be solved by declaring the variables. Uh, in the, the inside the parentheses, if you precede it with a semicolon, it's not a parameter. It just means I'm going to be using a variable whose name is n, and I want it to be a local variable. It's a very obscure syntax. A lot of these things like really surprise me. I thought, wow. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, it's only with lambdas um, because methods don't have that problem. They, they can't access anything by no side of them. Um, yeah. <coughs> so here is the only case that I've encountered where I, I might consider it um, appropriate to use the square brackets. I, um, in this testing team, we had a lot of big denested structures, you know, arrays and hashes and stuff. And having to type the, the square brackets and the quotation marks for five levels down was a super pain. And um, so uh, I wrote this thing to do it for them. It's not 100% reliable, but um, uh, it's helpful. And by the way, a lot of these tools um, are in a bag, a gem called Trick Bag, um, which trick underscore bag in case you want to ever find it. It's not GitHub, my ID is Keith Arbet. Um, okay, so anyway, using the Lambda's, Lambda's square brackets alias for the call method, we can implement a multi-level collection accessor that looks like the array and hash square brackets method. And so here you have an instance of calling it. It's gonna go, one, the first level it's gonna pass it one, the second level it's gonna pass it color, and it's gonna come back with this. Um, and um, similarly with, with arrays, um, it uses indexes. So, um, yeah, so here's a sample uh, deeply nested object, and we create the accessor calling this method, which, with the collection, which returns a lambda, which can then be used to access it. Now, um, as I said, you know, this is nowhere near 100% reliable, but um, it was pretty convenient for when we could use it. So, and, and, and in retrospect, I, I think it might still be a good idea not to use the square brackets because it's still gonna be confusing if people wanna know what is this thing called accessor. Um, so, maybe never use the square brackets for them. Okay. Private methods aren't really private. They can be accessed using the send method in Ruby, right? So, uh, here we have a private method and uh, we can just call send on it with this and then we get, we get the result. That can be very useful in unit testing, but um, it's not so good for really keeping something private, right? But lambdas local to a method really are private because really all they are are their local variables containing some literal object, kind of like a string assigned to a local variable. There's no way you can get to that from outside. Um, well, no normal way of getting to it. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, if you want something to be really private, you could make it a lambda. 
I don't work for the NSA, so that's not a problem for me, but. <laughs> um, Self-invoking anonymous functions. Although we normally call lambdas via variables, well, we already saw the calling of a lambda inline, right? So here we're creating a lambda, uh, and then we're just adding dot parens to the end of it. Um, why would we want to do this? Well, I think we've already said, so that we, uh, we're limiting the scope. And um, CoffeeScript uh, suggests using this approach in order to not pollute the outer namespace with um, variables. Lambdas are also natural for event handling. I, I worked with Java for 10 years, much of it with Java Swing, and uh, there's all kinds of event handling with that. And in Java, until recent versions of it, there were no lambdas. You had to create a whole new class to and then close a method and then pass that an instance of that class to the event handling mechanism. And it was just like a ridiculous amount of verbosity and complexity and ceremony, so much more than it should have been. Um, but lambdas are very easy for that. Customizable behavior, um, let's see, C sharp is an object oriented language, right? Um, probably similar to Java where you have polymorphism, yeah, you have a base class or an interface in Java, and you have subclasses that specialize in behavior. So for example, you might have an animal superclass and a dog and a cat subclass, and the animal might have a, a function uh, vocalize defined, and for a dog it would be woof, and for a cat it would be meow. And um, so that's the way to specialize behavior. You have classes that inherit from uh, superclasses, and um, uh, Ruby doesn't <clears throat> have to be quite so ceremonial because it uses duct typing. You don't need a superclass with a common method name to have this polymorphism, but you do still need to have classes with the same method name. If you want to be substituting behavior, of different classes, then um, you um, and be able to pass any an instance of any of those classes to some code that knows how to call it. Um, these method names all have to be the same, and this might have been in Java. This would probably be called filter rather than callout. But I figured that since this is really a callable object, um, you call it call. And by the way, uh, that dot paren notation works. On, it's like duct typing. It will work with anything that has a dot call method. It doesn't have to be a lambda. So it'll work with these instances as well, which is kind of nice because you don't have to worry. Like if you have a, um, uh, a method that's accepting input of some behavior, you don't have to care whether that behavior is a lambda or an instance of another class or what. As long as it has a call method, you can, um, well, you could have always just written dot call, but you can also use the dot parens if you want to. So here's an example, we have an even filter class and an odd filter class, and um, uh, then we have a method which just um, returns the objects that pass through the filter with success. And uh, when we call the method with an instance of the even filter, um, we get the even numbers. Um, now, check out how many lines this whole thing is, 18 lines. This one's eight in lambdas. And actually, it's more dramatic than that because uh, here it's lines one through 11, which have the behaviors that are being implemented. And here it's just one and two, right? So we have the even filter and the odd filter, and they're both very similar and they're both very concise. And this method is exactly the same as in the first slide. And then this is also the same, and um, it produces the same output. So lambdas are a very nice way of, of handling variable behavior. Sometimes you have methods that behave very similarly, but they're different in some way. If you have a situation like this, where the thing that differs is a single object, then you can simplify that code by creating uh, a lambda or a method that produces a lambda, passing that object that varies into this method, and it will return a lambda that has that value pre-filled in the lambda it's returning. So here we have um, double, triple, and quadruple. As you can see, this is the only column that has anything different, well, except for the names, of course. Um, 
So let's separate the data from the logic. How would we do that with lambdas? Well, one way is called partial application. This is the do-it-yourself way. Um, and I'll bypass these definitions because they might just be more confusing than looking at the code, but I put them there for reference. Um, so here we have a lambda. We're creating a lambda, giving it a name, assigning it to a local variable. And it takes a factor as a parameter, and it returns a lambda that, when called with a number, returns that number multiplied by the factor. So that, in a, in a way, we're embedding immutable data, not in a way, we're embedding immutable data in the method, the lambda that's being returned. Um, and uh, so we can, uh, this is a tripler, which is passing it three and getting it back a lambda that we can use to multiply any number by three. Any questions? Metaprogramming, it's almost similar to metaprogramming, where the function creates its own functions. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing, except instead of having a lambda that does it, it's a method. Um, but it's, other than that, it's exactly the same thing. Curry is another way of doing that. Um, and with curry, you don't really have to specify the logic yourself. It will just automatically prefill the first um, argument with whatever value you pass it. And I believe you can pass it more than one value as well. So whichever number of values you pass it, it will prefill those arguments in the function, in the, in the lambda. Um, so here we have a, a lambda that multiplies two numbers. Um, we're just calling curry with three and then using the same thing for the triple. That's the wrong value. I must have written that in. I'm sorry. I don't know. I was in a rush to get that finished. One for zero. Um, okay, predicates. Predicates. I found out about predicates when I was working with Java, um, and there was, this, there was this collection called Commons Collections, which uh, was a library and that has some really useful stuff. Predicates were one of the concepts where um, there were a lot of cases where you needed something that was going to return a true or false Boolean value, and so it, it had some framework. And because it was Java, it had to use a class and stuff, so I was very happy when I came to Ruby. And um, very often, uh, I can use uh, lambdas as predicates. Um, they're very useful for that. Here's a, uh, using a predicate as a filter. Now, when I was doing that network testing software, uh, there were times when I'd have to get prefill a buffer with n messages, maybe a thousand messages. but I needed to filter those messages, so I couldn't just ask the network for a thousand messages. I had to keep getting them until I had a thousand that passed the filter, right? And so um, this method accomplished that. Um, and the filter was variable, so I thought, I'll make it a parameter, and it'll be a lambda, it'll just pass in. And um, so this is using Ruby's default parameter, uh, default argument feature, where you can give it a default argument. And the default argument is a lambda that always returns true regardless of what it's passed. In, in effect, no filter. Okay. Um, but it's a parameter, so you can override it, you can, you can pass it. And um, so here we're using this filter, uh, and um, we're using the filter here and only adding the message to the array if the filter returns true for that message. Now, notice that this filter is a named parameter, and we're calling it if filter. So it's pretty clear what's going on there, right? Um, I mean, the word filter is there in two places, so we know that it's doing some filtering, and it's pretty explicit that that's what we're doing. The idiomatic Ruby way of doing something like this is with a block. So let's see what that looks like. This is what it looks like. Do you see the word filter anywhere? Do you see anything indicating in the message definition, that first line, that indicates that a filter is being passed? I rest my case. <laughs> I really like the, the, the passing the lambda as a much better alternative. Um, and and this, is, this is low level plumbing that you know, Ruby programmers should not be content to do. You know? um, it has its 
uses, I guess, when it's really necessary. But since we have another, uh, I mean, Ruby's all about clarity of code, right? It's all about revealing your intention very clearly and explicitly but concisely. So lambdas are great for that. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I um, found that I had to do is, in, in the case of getting all these messages, I wanted to um, uh, get like a, a block of them at a time. And so I started writing the code, you know, like the, the loop, you know, for getting the message and processing the message. And I realized, wait a minute, I'm doing more than one thing here in this code. I need to separate this out. You know, when we divide a large problem into multiple smaller problems, we drastically simplify the implementation. And that's what I wanted to do. So I thought, well, a lot of this logic is about buffering, uh, buffering the, the network messages I'm, I'm taking in and feeding them out to whoever wants them. So that's what an, an enumerable is, right? It's something that you can get things from, objects from. So I thought, okay, let me make an enumerable that buffers and I'll put all the, the buffering housekeeping in there so I don't have to deal with it here, right? And man, did that make it simpler. Um, and the buffered enumerable class, which is also in that trick bag time I mentioned, um, it, it handles a thing like uh, notification and filling and knowing when to fetch more and things like that. Um, but it doesn't know anything about how to get records. If it's going to be truly reusable, it can. You know, so the thing that actually gets the record to fill the buffer, that's a lambda that you pass in. And in that way, they can be used for any enumerable, any objects that you want to use. And um, uh, I won't get into it in this presentation, but um, you can build frameworks of lambda, uh, frameworks of lambdas, where uh, you can build lambdas uh, very simply, different kinds of criteria. Um, you can combine them with ands and ors, and um, it can be very powerful. And I think that's what Neil Ford was referring to when he talked about the you know, being able to return lambdas can be pretty great. Um, so here is the method signature, and it's taking a chunk size and a fetcher lambda, and also an optional fetch notifier, which um, will be called if it's there, uh, whenever it does a physical fetch. And that can be helpful for logging or for um, performance analysis, things like that. Um, now, some people said to me, well, yeah, but why don't you just create a base class and then I can subclass it? and provide those methods to do those things. And I thought, yeah, that's actually a good idea too. So you can do either one with this class. They're both supported. Uh, with lambdas, parentheses are mandatory, uh, unlike with methods. So when we create a lambda and we just refer to it by its name, this is just a local variable, it's just gonna show you, yeah, this is a lambda, because that's what it's referring to. Ruby does some special thing with the method calls that it doesn't do with regular variables, right? So you have to specify the parentheses, uh, whether you're doing dot .call or what, unless you're using the square brackets, which please don't do. Um, in some cases, you can use lambdas where you cannot even use methods. Like, for example, RSpec. Um, I tried putting a method in here that I was going to use to uh, test just pass in multiple values to do different tests with. This is just a trivial simplification of it. Um, and when I tried to do this, I got an error saying, no, you can't do that. I don't know what this method is. And so I thought, well, let me try a lambda. And a lambda works, because all you're doing is, you know, I mean, a lambda is like a string. You can assign a variable to a, str a string to a variable, you can assign a lambda to a variable. And um, that worked. So if there's something that a method is not, you can't use a method, try with a, um, try with a lambda, and I'll show you later um, a very, something that was very surprising to me. Um, so a, a method will return, uh, will work outside of the describe block, but I mean, my whole point was to make it local to the describe block, so I didn't use that approach. Um, converting from lambdas to blocks to procs, et cetera, um, if you have some code that is expecting a code block and you have a lambda that you want to use instead, you could just precede it with ampersand and that will kind of magically turn it into a code block. 
And uh, if you have a um, met method um, that you want to use where a lambda is expected, you can do this, which I've never had to do. <coughs> so the proc class is very confusing. Um, Ruby's proc class, um, uh, proc instances can be either lambda or non-lambda, both. Mainly is hard. When people name a non-lambda proc, they usually call it a proc or lowercase p. But lambdas are instances of the proc class. So when you're speaking, there is no way to differentiate between the two. And it's kind of a problem. I kind of wish that they had been two separate classes. Uh, and here's an example. We have a proc and a lambda. And we see here that the classes are identical. But lambda question mark is the method you call to find out which is which. And this one's false, this one's true. Um, they also differ in the way they return. Um, a lambda's return returns from a lambda, but not from the enclosing method. So here, we create a lambda that returns, and then call it. Um, and then we have this statement, which we do see output, which means that it's returning from a lambda, but not from foo. Okay. Um, but here, where we define it as a proc instead of a lambda, it does return from foo. So that's another difference. Um, arity checking. Arity is the number of arguments passed to a method. So with a lambda, uh, arity is checked and an error will be generated if it's the wrong number. With a proc, it won't. I'm going to pass over this because we're running out of time. Um, lambdas and procs are selfless. They don't really, if you put some output itself, you're not going to see anything related to the lambda. It's going to be the, the context, it's going to be the object that in which is contained in here, it's main. <coughs> This one surprised the heck out of me. Um, you can actually define classes in lambdas. You cannot do that in methods, but you can do it in lambdas. And the reason I found out about this was that I was writing code that, um, uh, experimenting with private, protected, and public, and, and so in my unit tests, I needed to create classes, and I wanted to remove those classes that I created to do the test. So I tried with the method, I got this error, I thought, eh, let me try lambdas. It worked, <laughs> very big surprise. Um, be careful about how you use it, you know, it's usually not a good idea, but uh, it's possible. Transform chains. Usually when we think of enumerables and, you know, like enumerable functions, we're thinking about data, but some, you can also reverse that. And the thing that's passed into the uh, enumerable, like inject, might be a data object, but the objects that it's enumerating over can be lambdas. So you can have a chain of transformations um, and those transformations can be lambdas. So for example, we have a tripler and a squarer. We create an array of them, and then we call inject on that array, and with a starting value, and we get the computed value of the sum of all the transformations. transformations. And that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. Any questions? Like lambda is like the address in the memory where it contains content. When you call it, it's uh, basically call an eval on the content of that address. It's the, not that complicated. C++, really. you have a pointer that stores value. Yes, don't think about C++. Okay. It's, it's, it's really different. Um, I mean, first of all, the lambda is um, it's interpreted when, when the source file is interpreted. So it's running Ruby code. It's, um, it's an object like other objects. You know. um, but it is, it is kind of closer to the metal in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? OK, thanks so much. Thank you. So, uh, About 46 yeah. minutes. Thank you.
uh, today I'm going to present uh, JavaScript callback promise and async away. This is the concept how uh, JavaScript handle asynchronous uh, operation. So before I begin my slide, I would like to uh, explain how JavaScript function works. So let's go to the compiler. So in JavaScript function as a first class citizen, so basically you can define a variable, let's say a, and then you can assign a function, let's say So basically, you can just assign a function inside the variable. And to NC here, sorry. So, and also, you can not just assign function inside a variable, you also can uh, assign a function inside a function, which is something like this. But let's say add is a function, you can add a function inside a function. This is like some JavaScript concept. Okay? So let's begin my Wait, sorry. So, yeah. so can you go back to that code that yeah, sure. sure. What's happening here? Wait, so basically so you're yeah. defining a function yep. and then okay. passing it to the add method. So I define a function assigned to the add function argument. Which right, is like, add, right? yeah. Yeah. It's like you can pass a function into the <coughs> function argument. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah, function into the function. Mm -hmm. And also JavaScript, you can function and return the function. So basically, fun function is a first class citizen. So sorry. So function is a first class citizen first class citizen in JavaScript. So okay, let's begin my slide. So Callback. So, what <coughs> so let me explain asynchronous programming. So, JavaScript is a single threaded programming language. So, in JavaScript, you don't have thread, multi threaded, just single thread. So, JavaScript is also born as is born asynchronous. So, today we're going to talk about uh, I/O operation, like how to handle um, read file, network API call, and uh, some some operation you need to log it until you finish on it to call back to get the result. So let's begin. So this is the callback example like before 2015. So basically it just uh, we create a app 10 API call. So this set time out we just simulate the network call. So what we're doing is that we put a we call an app 10 API call with 10 value which is reference value here and then we set a timeout inside so like after 2 seconds it will invoke this uh, it will return this callback function so basically it's like I add a 10 and after 2 seconds it will value plus 10 and then return back the callback function which is here which I get a result and then console I print the result here so if anyone don't understand this code Yep. So, what would be an example implementation of callback function? In that okay. example? Basically, it's like this. When you can assume this app 10 API is a, like a network call API, then you just add an argument inside, and then which the API need like 2 seconds, 3 seconds need to respond from the server. So, so you can see, uh, I just use timeout to just simulate the API, network API simulation. So, so when the function is done, so I just return this callback reference, which is the this, this one, which is a this return callback function, which is referenced by here. Oh, it was passed in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's okay, no problem. You can ask any question. So when well, like after two seconds, it's like you will return this callback function with the value plus 10, which is referenced here, so I can get the result that I need. So this is just one uh, network, like just one asynchronous call. How about I got three? Okay, let's say I define at 10, at 20, very easy. Okay. Uh, at 10, at 20, and at 30. 
which is I call the at 10 function and pass it to 10. Okay, so uh, let me explain this force. Basically, this force is just like simulate the like database error or network error. It's just a simulation. It's just, it's just an example for showing uh, the API is okay. So we can see that um, the oh, yeah. Okay, the function, the first function at 10, which is I put in 10, false, and a callback function, which is here. So basically, you will check the error is it's not true. So you go here. Same thing, you will call a set, set timeout function and then call back the value plus 10. So basically, it's just at 10, at 20, and at 30, and I get the 7, output 70. So which reference by this, this callback function. This is how JavaScript handle callback before 2015. So we can call this as callback now because you guys like got so many nested uh, nested uh, nested callback function it will confuse the developer. It will confuse you. So in 2015 the Atma script which is the standard of the JavaScript. They got a committee called ECMA. They got a committee called, committee called the TC39, which is the technical committee 30, 39. And then they will define the standard which every JavaScript engine they have to follow the standard. Okay? So let's let's go promise. So promise is to solve the callback help. So promise is an object that lets you handle asynchronous callback easily. And con promise consists of three states, which is pending, resolve, and reject. Uh, the pending state is just like you're waiting the API call, you're waiting the refile operation, so it shows pending state. So when you've done the operation, it marks as resolve function. Like if you got any error happen in the operation, just call the reject. So promise makes change, changing the function more straightforward and simplify the code. So let's see the example how to define promise. So let's say in a function, at 10 function, now we just got two arguments which is value and error. Error. So we create a new we, we create a new promise object. It consists of function inside or uh, the already like it already consists of the resolve and reject function. So how it works? So the function is like when the <coughs> When the function is done, which is the operation is done, you just mark resolve. Then the at 10 will return a promise to the another function. Yes? What is that parentheses construct in JavaScript? The, the oh, resolve yeah. Reject? Resolve reject, okay. Is Let me explain. Or? Actually, this is uh, in JavaScript for the modern JavaScript. We can use arrow function also with the function with the name. Something like this. I can show the example. It's like you can define this as a <coughs> function. And in JavaScript, we call it as error function. But I mean, the parentheses that contain resolve and reject. Oh, yeah. What the parent, okay, the so parentheses. Is it a tuple or an array? Or? Sorry? It's a, is it a tuple or an array? Or what is it's, it? a, it's a function. It's a function from promise. So the promise brings the resolve and reject into this arrow function. It's a scope. It's like a block. It's a, scope. It's a block. It's, a it's block. like a scope. When you start a function, you have a start and end, right? Yeah. It's like a block. So you, yeah. it's a Java block. And we're talking about that friends resolve, comma, reject, close friend. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, line two or line two? Yeah, line, line two. Line two. Line two here? New promise. Oh, because it's uh, anonymous. We call it anonymous function. So you yeah. can create a function just like lambda. Just create one and anonymous without giving it the name. Yeah, you can oh. do it like this. So yeah. you can see like there's something like. So it's an anonymous function. Those are, those are the arguments to the function? Yes. Ah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is also called anonymous function. And you don't need to define a name for the function in JavaScript. In JavaScript. Okay. So basically, what it do is that when the promise is created, it consists of resolve and reject by default. You can get from you can get from this here. Okay. After you done the 
operation, right? You settle the case, you just mark resolve, and with the result, and then here you see the result will come, come to the dam here. So you get the first result. So this with promise, the code is much clearer compared to like the callback and the promise chain. So, can I ask you a stupid question? I, I, as you can see, yeah, I don't know exactly. anything about JavaScript. No problem. Yeah. Like other programming languages just have synchronous calls. Yes. Why didn't JavaScript do that? Because of JavaScript is a single track uh, programming language. But you normally, know. like if you're getting the information with disk, you usually want to wait for it to come back before you proceed because you're going to do something with that information, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. So that's why JavaScript don't wait. It's like JavaScript can't wait the API come back on the execute the next line. So it's so faster. It's, it's I mean, like, I can understand like on the web client side where you're like requesting a lot of things at once and you're yep. waiting for everything. But for like just like if I'm reading a file and I want to do something with it, it seems to me like and and some I've seen some libraries or languages might have. Both a synchronous and an asynchronous interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. So, I mean, if, if you had a synchronous interface, you wouldn't need to do all these callbacks. It would be a lot simpler. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. So, especially um, that's why the promise only deal with like certain like specific case. That's why the network request file, read file, or you're going to transform some images. It takes time. So that's why JavaScript like okay, like for example, like <clears throat> JavaScript. Try to, let's say you got a console lock here. So lock A. Okay. And console lock B. So you set the timeout. <coughs> set the timeout. Put the function inside. So something like this. So the result is not like A C B. So you can see it's A B C. Because of JavaScript don't read. So it definitely will run the number line and five first and then come back to here. Something like this. So it is because you put the two second. Yeah, yeah I simulate some uh, like delay. delay yeah, <coughs> delay, delay yeah. trading. So the the I mean yeah. But the, what I want to explain is that the JavaScript don't mean. Yeah, only you do some callback. It you will come back to the function to resolve the uh, specific operation. That's why we got a, a promise to set to handle to set to set up this kind of. Problem. So we we'll compare the callback method and the promise chain. So the event code base, is much, yeah. yeah. So the event base. Yeah. Yeah. The code is much cleaner mm -hmm. and easy to like, is easy to read as well. So another concept in JavaScript is the new thing in Atmosphere 2017. It's called async await. So what is async await? So async await is a statement of uh, synthetic sugar put on top of JavaScript promise. They allow us to write promise based code as if we were synchronous but without blocking the main thread. So basically, it's like the async await is to enhance the promise to easily to let you handle the promise in JavaScript. So let's see the example how we create the async await in JavaScript. So basically, let's see this function. So if you want to define a async or a single sync, a function, you just put a sync in front of function. And then the same thing, like the same promise here. What you do is that uh, you just put a await uh, keyword, it just it, it will block, it will block until the case solved. Only you call the second time. Is any <coughs> any confusion on this? So Basically, what the thing a way to do is that it's just a syntactic sugar to help you to manage the promise. So, if the code you can see, uh, 
if you compare the passing away pattern or and the forming stream, it just like it, it let you easy to understand how you handle the promise, which is the first result is depends on the second result and the third result is third result is depend on the second result. So it goes to the same same result. And also, also if you want to use the uh, a single way you uh, must uh, add a try catch uh, try catch uh, to, to to capture some error if you got some error it happen in this try block. So basically this how as an await work. Is there a feature to await multiple things? Uh, no. Ah, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <coughs> you ask the the threads you call join to wait for them to all finish. You ask the right question. So I will explain. Sorry. No, no problem, no problem. <laughs> so example you've got three promises. The same promises you want to like you see, you see the set line on in a different time, which is it, it will complete in different different we complete the task in different time. So which means that if you use the async the synchronous function, you will await three promises, right? So in JavaScript we got the we got the promise function is called promise off. So basically it looks like you can if you want to step it happen in parallel, like what just what you mentioned just now, you can simply just use promise off. It will combine all the promises and with the await keyword. After it sorry, after it finish all the promises, only it go back to here. Actually, wouldn't that also happen the other way too? Like in the previous yeah, slide? Yeah, it's the same thing. You, same thing? Same thing, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. That's why you can see it's like await who, await what, await where. It's the same thing. Because as long as they're all happening asynchronously, you won't get past that third con C line until you're all done. Yep. Right? True. If the await keyword. So, so this is kind of the destructuring. So basically, the promise all is an array of promise. And this is a kind of a JavaScript technique to destructure the array into the object so you can access the A and B and C. Yeah. So I think that's all for my slide. Any question? Yeah, this is up. Well, we would like to discuss the question. Yeah. Any question? I have a lot of questions, but I didn't want to like take up more of your time. Can you go back from the beginning? <laughs> Is that going too fast? What? Is that going too fast? No, it's not that you were going too fast. It's just that I have no exposure to JavaScript, very little, ah. and a lot of the stuff was confusing me. I, I couldn't keep up with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, what you want to ask? Like, comment? I, I don't even remember now. Um, Promise? Let's go back. Uh, um, How about this? Okay. So, so yeah, one of the, the things that really hit me about this code was that. Uh -huh, yeah. That entire code, except for the first few characters of the first line, is that function definition. Right? Okay, yes. Right? Yes, yes. And so I, I guess it's a JavaScript um, convention to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But to me, like I was saying, okay, where does it end, you know? And yeah, that's why that's why we don't we don't practice this. <laughs> we don't practice this anymore because of it's like very hard to maintain the code. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean very hard to read. Very hard to understand. That's why this is like previously like 2014 how JavaScript developer deal with the asynchronous which is callback. So you have so many callbacks. It's like you don't know like which which type which depend on the which value. That's why we come out the promise a single way to handle. So I, about the asynchronous nature of JavaScript, mm -hmm. I totally understand it if you're on a web client side and you're making requests and you know couldn't possibly be synchronous. But JavaScript is also used on the server side too, right? Yes. Node.js, for okay. example. Okay. Yeah. True. True. That's so fine. what are they doing about like writing regular programs in, in JavaScript? I mean, a lot of stuff in, in backend programming really is synchronous, right? Yeah. So are they having to go through all these code acrobatics to to wait for a, a file read to finish or something? No, 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 no. That's that's why no. And okay, if you talk about the backend in JavaScript, mm -hmm. like the modern Node.js. We use the VA engine. Mm -hmm. So the VA has got a so called like event, uh, so it's called the, okay, what's the name? It's like the event stack, which is the, it's 
the synchronous, which like okay, let's say the uh, the first function you run is at that, then you will wait for the wait for this. Definitely not wait for this. It's just like a, it's just like a queue. It's like which function come in, I solve which first. Only I finish it, I it's like when this third function finishes, I will go definitely go back here first. It's like asynchronous. It's asynchronous. It's asynchronous. Yeah. It's very hard to design. It's like yeah, because of asynchronous is for those problems is like dealing with this event is an event based. So once you trigger the first event, a listener will take care of it and yeah. send back a reply. So it varies. So which message get processed first? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I write Ruby code and it's yep. kind of like back end or command line stuff. And yep. like, if I had to, if I had to deal uh, with an asynchronous yes. framework, it would like double the complexity of my code. It depends. It, 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 it yes. depends on understanding. Yeah, it depends how you architect it. So mm -hmm. if you architect it as a event driven by a distributed system, at first everything is a microsystem. Yep. So you will have that complexity started mm -hmm. when you design it. You need to manage the um, the event that's not within linear time. It might go in multiple ways. So it's a microsystem. Yeah. Smaller microsystem. But low level things like file rates, for example. Is that also event driven, even on Node.js? You use a <coughs> sync and await. Yeah. If you rely on that file system, so you make it linear, you forcefully make it linear. Have you heard the term incidental complexity? It means complexity that's required by the framework or environment that you're in that doesn't really add to the expression of the problem or the solution. You know? mm -hmm. And um, I, maybe this is why so many JavaScript transpilers have sprung up, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. If you use the latest feature that the yeah. browser don't support, Definitely, you need the Babel transpiler yes. to convert your modern JavaScript code into the old JavaScript code the in order browser. to run in the old browser and yes. the support browser. Yeah. Question about the asynchronous. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Is it about ES9 for the same? Uh, no, it's a ES2007. 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 Yeah. So for promise is ES2015. Mm. You define the promise in 2015, that's why you can use it. Mm -hmm. Yep, correct. JavaScript, like before that, you just you can use callback. Like callback, callback, callback. Okay. Any more question? Any question? No question. Okay, we move to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I try to 
stand here for a while. Okay? Okay, so Shen uh, Tong here, okay, today, let me introduce myself. So I'm uh, currently uh, running a digital agency called Travelbits. So uh, I've, I've been in the tech industry since six years ago. I started with a tech startup called Jonas and then I went into Wi-Fi marketing and then currently I'm running this digital branding agency. So why I want to share this is because I met with a lot of I work with a lot of freelancers and then basically I think almost 80% of our tasks in our company are done by freelancers. So we utilize a lot of freelancers in the company. And in fact, there's a lot of freelancers that we deal with. So there are a lot of problems dealing with freelancers. So how many of you have been doing freelancing? Like what kind of freelancing? Programming? What else? Design? Operating, maybe video shooting and stuff. So, um, so the sharing of this is uh, actually I want to share to you from a perspective of mine because I, I'm a freelancer as well personally before we actually uh, from a freelancing move into a digital agency. So with this kind of presentation, expert, some, some expectation setting first uh, you you won't be learning where to get the jobs from from, from this presentation because it's actually the theme is uh, today, which is how to actually look better as a freelancer. So I'm going to share some of this stuff. So these are some of the topics that we are going to be covering today. So first thing is professionalism. Okay. So we are going to uh, share about value work prioritization and then a decision matrix, and then I'm going to share to you about addition versus multiplication strategy. Which is this is actually something very 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 good. You can apply addition and multiplication strategy in anything in your life. Basically, anything you can apply, even your love life. So yeah, I can explain more about that later. And then the last thing I think is about budgeting as a freelancer. Freelancer, how you actually budget you know, for the client and stuff. What are the things that, and that you should be considered in your budget, right? And then lastly, will be some pricing models for a freelancer. So let's start with uh, professionalism. So before I move to the next slide, so what is professionalism? Or what is professional to you? Anyone? Good at what you do. Sorry? Good at what you do. Good at what? Whatever you do. Yes, uh, your quality of work. What else? Yep. Communicating um, clearly and um, not emotionally. Yes, okay, yes. What else? Come on. I, of you guys have been doing freelancing. Okay. Finish work on time. Yes, yes, that's it, that's it. Okay. Okay, so basically, this is what I put on the slide. So, on time, in control, quality of work and service, responsible, communicative. And the last, I think the last point I would like to emphasize, which is control. <coughs> but I'll go through it uh, one by one. This is what I feel uh, because we have to deal with many freelancers. A lot, a lot of problem, a lot of good one as well. So first thing is you have to be on time and punctual. I know this is Malaysian timing, Malaysian time, right? I don't know whether you heard of Malaysian timing where they always be late by about thirty minutes. So you should not do that when you're going to appointment or to the meeting. You should what you should do is that you should set your time. You, know? you should set an appointment. You should set a reminder on your phone. That's Google Calendar right now. Okay. So you you can use tools like Google Calendar. Or doodle to set an appointment or meeting with your client, and it reminds you and the client together as well. So you won't be like going to Starbucks and then, hello, why you are still not here? Right? So it will remind the client as well. And then another thing which is uh, punctuality is not just on the meeting, it's on what? It's on the deliverables. When you promise that you're going to deliver by, let's say, today, so if you are not able to deliver it, how are you going to deal with it? Okay? If you're really late, Okay, you have some problem, you have to communicate it with your client first. If until today you tell me that, sorry, I could not finish this, that's not professional anymore. You have to communicate with them two, three days before that. Because you should know that within two, three days or within one day, you are unable to finish it. You should communicate the situation to your client first. Right? Unless you have a very, very good reason that, okay, I'm unable to do that. Example, I'm unable to go to a meeting because actually, my parents are, have said something, but don't always use this method. 
I have seen a lot of people say, oh, my father passed away, say, what the fuck? Is it real or not? My father go to the hospital? So don't be that kind of people, right? You, you are doing freelancing, it's not just a part I mean, when you are doing freelance, you actually learn, you train yourself, you train your skills, and then you deliver your quality. It's also a part of your own personal branding as well. So be someone which you communicate first. Okay, if there's something which is, you know, it happens, and then suddenly you need to find a good reason for it, don't go in that, right? Because you're a professional. And then how you actually can have a good planning on especially your timeline. Anyone here are using Gantra? Ooh. Not using Gantra. Yes, good. People are using Gantra. So you can try to go and Google and find out what is actually a Gantra. It's a G A N T T C H A R T. You can Google it, uh, you can do it on a Excel or on a Google Sheet. So when you have a Gantra, how you actually plan? That means you plan like, uh, with them. each of every module that you want to code, uh, things that you want to design, your work and task, you try to break it down and then you plan to it. But don't plan towards the goal. Plan backward from the goal. That's why we try to use backward planning. Anyone know what's backward planning? No idea. Okay, let me share about backward planning. So, okay. so why is backward planning? Backward planning basically, when you plan forward, plan like this. You start a meeting, and then uh, let's say you do UI UX, <coughs> UI UX, and then you do coding, uh, back end, front end, and then Broadcasting, blah, blah 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 until deliver. Right? Usually you go with this process, but this is not effective. Trust me. I have done a lot of project management and this is not effective. What you should do is that let's say you're going to deliver 31st of uh, May. This is going to be launched. Okay? It's going to be it's going to be live. So what's the next thing I have to do? Three days before you should you should have it. Okay, three days before you should do something like bug testing, right? You should okay, and then before three days before bug, bug testing, where is it on the production or on the staging side, right? It should be on the stage production side, okay? right? So three days before, again, okay, what you should do? <coughs> you should do bug testing on where? On your staging side, and then maybe one day before you move move from stage staging to production. You should plan like this. So you plan, 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 and this is the first day you meeting with client. Or maybe this is this discussing about UI UX. You should plan backward. So you 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 be able to hit your goal. Plan like this. So it's not forward thinking, it's backward thinking. This is the correct one. You should use this one. Right? A lot of corporate are using this. Unless you work with corporate, then you will know how to do a gun chart. And if you want to know what's a gun chart, you can Google it. I don't think I want to draw it here. It's very complicated to draw a gun chart. So if you translate this into a gun chart, it will look something like task, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, date, 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 date. You have something like this. Something like that. Right? And then this is the date. So you should plan from here, backward planning. Like this, you you be more effective uh, when you want to, you know, be on time. Try to use this backward planning instead of forward planning, right? This kind of work planning, a lot of people are using, a lot of teams are using. When we are managing team, we always use backward planning. Okay, this will actually be able to help you become more productive and become more effective. And what if you have something that you know something happens, then you can change a bit of the timeline here. And then you should communicate this with your client. How you communicate this with your client? You're using Google Sheet, man, right? Share it to them. Ah. So you will be very, very transparent. What if something happened? Right? So they will know. You add on say, oh, there's a little bit delay because I'm sick and what and what. You are free and so man, right? You won't have sick leave, but you will be sick one, man, because you are human, right? You have some emergency. So share this to your client, right? Every client should have a piece of the ganja to the project. This is professional, right? You do even if you are a freelancer, you do stuff like corporate, systemize it. Okay? Next is uh, quality of work and services, like what you guys say is the stuff you have to deliver it. Example, I'll give you a very simple example. What is professional, what is non-professional? 
you are doing a website, simple website, WordPress, HTML, CSS, anything. The clients give you the content, you just put it up, okay, put it up, content, nicely put, and then you just pass to them without checking anything. That's not professional enough. Probably you say, uh, you're trying to find out, hey, there's a spelling error in the context, okay, in the content that you already put in. Then you say, uh, this is not my problem because you give me the content, I put it up, I just copy pasted it. And this is why you're not professional. If they're giving you something which is not under, even not under your task, which is you're doing the coding, they should give you the copywriting and stuff, everything. You should actually just prove it. Very simple, you know. Put it. Do you have a Grammarly, Google, Google Word Office? You have, right? You see, you just kindly just check the spelling. That's it. If there are any spelling or grammatical error, they can go for the copywriter. So at least you do that, you differentiate yourself from the competitor. You are more professional than a lot of people already. So I would like to work with you more than work with some other people who just copy and paste the text and they don't care about it. They just pass it. This is final. Okay? And then, uh, next is be responsible. Yes, that means, uh, like what we have already mentioned just now, you have to be responsible for your task, okay, the quality of the work, and then be communicative. If something happens to the timeline, communicate with them, transparent with them. And lastly, this is very important control your growth. Uh, I really recommend everyone go and buy this book. It's called, I think it's called The Company of One. Yeah, you can Google it. Uh, actually, I got this link from, from, from Gui. I think he shared one of the what, best product. Gui, previously you shared a, a, a link that uh, best product of the year, right? Or something, something like that, right? So this is one of the best book for a startup. It's actually uh, focusing on mini, minimal company, okay? That means uh, the next big thing is minimal growth, control growth, okay? So you should read this book. Why we are, we are talking about controlling growth? Okay, so how many of you are doing freelancing alone? We are any team. Okay. How many of you have having team are doing together with two or three people work together as a team? Yeah. So we, we have we have people. So example. Okay. So you are one person team. One person. You're two person team, example. So one person team, how much you can make in a month? Any any figures? Freelancing? How much? Okay. Uh, based on experience, how much you can make in a month? Okay, how much you can make in a month? Terrible depends. <laughs> okay, Let, let's let's put a let's put a, a figure so we can calculate. Let's say you are able to make five thousand ringgit a month. Okay, it's not US dollar, right? <laughs> okay, uh, five thousand ringgit a month. So what is what is meant by controlling the growth? What's that? So, example, this client, uh, this is you, uh, and then this is your client. Yeah, where? Well, uh, okay, this is client. So, this client, we call client A. Client A will give you a job, 10,000, and ask you to finish it in one month. Do you want to accept it? Of You need to finish it in one month. But in average, you are making 5k a month. With the past experience, you are doing that. So we we'll accept this. You can accept it if, if you have to consider two things, basically. First thing is quality of work. Okay? Second thing is what? Do you have the capacity? Basically, it's these two things. If you're, he's giving you a 10,000 okay, 10,000 kind of uh, regular Malaysia job and then you say, I can finish it in one month but in the end, you couldn't and then you, you drag two months, three months right, three months three months you can make 15k right now, three months you only make 10k only why? because first thing you don't you, you, you don't know your capacity and the capability and the quality as well it will drop definitely because normally you get 15,000 for 3 months but right now you only get 10,000 for 3 months it's less than 5k a month already you get a 2 month vacation though. sorry? but you get a 2 month vacation right? 
Yeah, for me, no? but this depends on experience and your capability. So that's why your capacity and quality is very important. I would say rather than you, you, you go for a, five, a 5K job with an A quality, rather than a 10K job with B quality, always quality better than quantity. Because why? This one you will get retainer. This one you won't get retainer because for this, for this shitty job. Right? So always control your goal. You must know your capacity is what. So from the book, company of one, or this is something I think quite quite fresh for a lot of people. Okay. So always if if you are anyone can be in sales before. Sales, no, right? Usually if you are in sales, right, your boss will say, okay, this month you have to hit 10,000. Okay, 10,000 is a goal. But this is a, not a good way. What if you, like, like I said just now, what if you hit 20,000 sales? Is this good? Uh? Actually not good, why? Uh? 20,000 if your company only able to handle 15K uh, <coughs> max, 5K will be sh shitty job. This will drop the quality and you won't get retainer. So, don't, so how you should set the goal is not 5K a month. You should know your upper boundary is what? 5 to 7.5K a month. This is what I can do. Alone. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you're you are having team, you're having a lot of people who are joining you. Let's say, if right now we have two people. So two people, I can do 10 to 20K a job. This is fine. You, do, you grow like this. You don't just money, money, or come, I think. You know, how many projects I have at a time? Maximum. Uh, okay, I break down in this. Uh, marketing, uh, I'm the only project manager. When, when, that, that one is like two years ago, when I first started. Okay, uh, I break down into marketing, uh, customized project, customized system, and then normal WordPress website. Guess how, how many projects I have on hand? 24. Five, right? Custom project, how, how much? Custom project is normally those that is uh, more than three months on. I got like seven. The rest, I think around 10 or 11 are WordPress project. Three are marketing project. I died. I lost a lot of customer, right? So this is a lesson that I learned. And then luckily I found the book called Company One. Really, you guys should get this book. You can get it from Amazon. If you're able to get it, if not, you can get it from Singapore. I think Kino, Kumia, uh, sorry, if not, you can get it from Kindle, from there, from Amazon. So, yeah, yeah, yeah you can get it from Kindle. Uh. So, try to get this book, it's very, very good, especially for those who want to start an agency, you want to start small, because my idea team is that I want to only have 10 people max on my team. So, this is something that I really uh, would love to have. Okay. How much time I still have? Okay, so any question? Okay, let's go to the next one. So, okay, I believe that a lot of, this is not only applicable to freelancing. This is a strategy that is applicable to anyone that you have tasks on hand. So it's called, uh, which I, I name it myself, which is called Value Work Prioritization. So there's only three steps to do this. First is that you create a to-do list. A, B, C, D, F, G, 1, 3, 4, 5, 10. Every day you have to do this or you have to do this. You have to take this as, as a habit to become more effective. Secondly, assign value to the task. This is what I put like, I should put dollar sign. You want to just dollar big my wife put the sharing gate, right? It won't make you move. It motivates you because it's US dollar. Right? So I put a I put a dollar sign there, so I put one thousand dollar, five hundred dollar, one hundred fifty dollar, fifty dollar, ten dollar. So from here you know which task is actually bringing you more value and then prioritize the task with higher value. So this is a sample. So this is a to-do list, a sample like, okay, let's say preparing a proposal for client, it costs you $500. I mean, it, it has value of $500 because, but if this proposal is successful, you may, maybe you can make $10,000. You can use this as, as a quotation for your client as well, right? based on this as well. So of course, if there's a client, you're meeting a client at 3 p.m., Cost one thousand dollar lah because you might be able to post this new money, correct or not? But what if there's another client which is also want to meet you at three pm, but they are, have high budget? Of course, you want to meet them first lah, right? This is how you prioritize the work, right? You have to tell them, oh, sorry, I have another urgent meeting. Find whatever, whatever reason to meet the bigger client first because it has a higher budget value for you. And then okay, maybe call the website because you are actually executing the job. 
Okay, five hundred dollar. I call the website, give the location, okay, five hundred dollar. So this one actually it depends on your task. Right? You define it yourself. So this is just one of my sample. And then uh, maybe fix UI bugs, fix some corporate or some styling issue. It's a ten dollar, ten dollar task. Then do it later. Or maybe reply some some email, so some inquiry you can put it on that. Okay, and then functional bug, because it's a functional, so maybe it has more effect okay, to the function of the application for the client. So you might put it higher, and then uh, do the UX design, you're, you're doing, doing the design work for the, for the project. Maybe this project will be closed, okay, and then it's, let's say it's a 100,000 project, so you're doing a UI UX first for that, right? And you can, you can really high based on what you want, and then team meeting is very important, <coughs> right? You need to motivate them, you need to tell them the direction and stuff. So you, you assign value to them, depends on you. So last one is, is what I want to emphasize on the, on the, on the next few slide, okay, which is a prepared SOP for work. How many of you work with work in corporate before? Corporate guy? Yes. SOP is very important, right? Yes, it is. A lot of non-corporate people thought that SOP is bullshit. No. Later you know why SOP is so good. Okay. Yeah, good, good one. Let's go to the next one. So uh, another method you can use this, which is called the Edison Hour Box. Okay, this is the decision matrix where you do decision. It's very, very good. It's very simple, right? You on, on, your, on, your, on your desktop, you have a wallpaper, right? Uh, put like this, uh, put your files, put your project files here, and then you need to decide what's actually task. Oh, in Windows, you can do something called sticky note. I don't know whether Mac has something called sticky note. Yes. Yeah, you put a sticky note here, then you know. Okay, what you have to do now, okay? The things that are very important and urgent you have to do now, right? Then those which is important but not urgent, you schedule it. Example, you're going to close a client, but it's not an urgent because the client is not urgent as well. So you just profit that. And then those things who are not important, you have to delegate up. Maybe you're a coder, okay? You want to find someone to do a operating for the website, or maybe do a UI design, you delegate to someone to do it. Find someone to do it, don't do it yourself, because you waste your time. Okay, priority is on the important and urgent one. And if it's not urgent or important, like let's say go for an Avengers movie. Don't lie. If you are, if you are looking for money, then don't lie. But you, you can basically you can use this for your life or your work as well. But just try to integrate everything inside. If you are really book focused kind of guy, you should know what are things which is important, what are things which is urgent, what are things are not urgent, what are things which is not important. Priorities. Yes, priorities. <coughs> You know, right? So, okay, this is something uh, I would like to emphasize today, which is uh, I posted this last week on my social media page, on my Facebook page, on the private page. Um, it's called the strategy of uh, addition and multiplication. Okay, so why you're having this space? Because you keep doing the addition kind of work. And if you are happy because you're multiplicating, you're doing multiplication. So this is something which we can apply this anything, <coughs> anything, I repeat again, anything in our life we can use addition and multiplication strategy. Most of us in our life, why we are not successful because we keep using addition strategy, we are not using the multiplication strategy. Okay, so that's the first. So addition, addition is what? Addition is you work in the task, you work hard. Right? You work very, very hard to finish this task. Example, you do a coding, you do a design, you're executing, you're selling, you're doing meetings and appointment and all this stuff. You do the stuff yourself. Okay? The qualification is that you work on the task. Now, there's a difference. Huh? Work in the task, that means you work inside the task. Work on the task, that means you work outside from the task and work on it. So it's very important because it, it's a work smart strategy. What are multiplication strategy, which is strategizing? Okay? <coughs> SOP, systemizing, branding, marketing, planning. These are the things which is considered as multiplication. So, what is multiplication? Okay, anyone? Very well, fans? No? No one? Okay, maybe I'm the only one here. So, if, 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 if you're going to become super saiyan, okay, this is called super saiyan, right? Anyone know Dragon Ball? No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when, when, when Goku learned Kamehameha, it's only an additional strategy because you learn how to use the skill only. But if you can go super saiyan, that means you multiply your power. Fifty times and then two times of super saiyan, four times of super saiyan two. So this is you yeah, transform. Yeah, basically you transform. So so you, you multiply. So this photo I really got from Google. I don't know whether it's true or not. Sorry that if there's any 
uh, true and real camera fans. <laughs> so okay, why 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 repeat? Okay, when you can multiply. What's multiply? Multiply is basically. Can I change the word polymorphism? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically add, 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 add. This is multiplication. So why do keep doing repeat work? Programmer that I deal with, freelancer that I deal with, they really, really, really like to do repeat work. We don't do repeat work. Okay, take it through. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully you guys are very good at it. So, so these are some examples. So I, I'm trying to put this as a more to the coding side. So what is multiplication? When you code something, do you keep your code? Keep it nicely. Yes, yes. Nice, good, good. You have an archive or something. So do you make code templates? Okay. When you can't do it, when you call Alex, let, let's say I'm only paying you 1,000 ringgit to do this website. Are your code reusable? If you want, depends on what you so try to make everything reusable, if possible. Because what if you get the next job which is similar thing, you can just copy paste. My friend can basically generate an in invoice report with the framework. You have a very good SQL guy you can do it five minutes. Yeah. 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 So always think about reusability. Don't just code whatever you want first and function. Think how you can reuse it. Because if you're not doing freelancing for one time or you might be able to use it maybe on a full time job as well, maybe on other, other tasks as well. So try to make sure every time your, your code is reusable. SOP documentation, very, very important. Why is not important? Why is not important? Why is it important SOP compared to IT? For, I would say, for training purposes and not really focus too much on training, but uh, all towards the era of uh, maintainability of you know, the team size. Yes, right. You might be doing freelancing alone. Next few months, you might have a team joining you together. Right? You have documentation which shows what's your API, la, this is for what, this is for what. You have everything structured, everything ready, your devops, everything is a document. It will help. It definitely will help. Because you can. Copy, copy, copy. So, why SOP is important because it is a multiplication strategy when you actually multiply your time. Right? You don't need to repeat to someone else, someone in terms of, hey, this is, this, this is how, how is it? Okay. Or what if you, you get someone to do the formation or you do it yourself? You keep it. Always think about the future. Don't think things for the short term. Okay? And yeah, email templates. How many of you are using email templates? Yeah. You should use email template, especially those that ask you for inquiry, your, your portfolio website. Hello, oh, no, I want a quotation, blah, 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 blah. Then they should say, oh, this is my quotation. You should have a template for your documentation, for your quotation as well, for your email and all, all these are proposal template. And then have an archive library with your code, documentation, everything doing nicely properly. If you can't write, you can hire some student or some part timers doing for you. Right? You don't want to do it, so. This is delicate lah. I also don't like to do one. That's why I don't do it. Because you can online. Yeah, but you have to change it according to your, your company logo lah. This and that. Okay. Terms are different. If you can use your friend, then you have good friends lah. Or you are the only bad friend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So try to use uh, meeting tools as well. Like what I said just now, Google Calendar. Okay, format tools, Moodles and stuff, you can use that. But it's not a reminder and everything. Especially if you have team meeting, oh sorry, I forgot that there's a meeting. Uh. The phone reminds you, uh, if your phone spoils, uh, don't be a coder, uh, please. <laughs> right, because you're a tech guy, you should always have a phone with you. And then, uh, good handle. Automation is very important. Try to use automation tools. If you are running an agency or you have a bigger clientele, you should use CRM. You know what I mean? Try to use that. It's, uh, and, uh, yeah, especially I really like Google Calendar. I use a lot, right? and then uh, other tools like Trello, Trello Slack. That is a good communication channel. And then like I just want to say, you have to be communicative with your client, right? So how you should you should create a Trello and share to them as well. Right? And Trello company is paid really, right? No, paid. Not paid. So then I think I guess that's a you want to because I, I use it like a long time ago. So 
Okay, so this is the this is some other ways of multiplication. So anyone have any, any more ideas that is a multiply multiplication theory or strategy that you use? Anyone have good case but this is Yeah. I use wonder list. Yeah. It's, it's uh, great for creating different kinds of lists. Yes. This is a tool. Yes. Anyone? Any tools that you guys are using that you think you can share with the crowd? It's good. One. Okay. So I, I, I would say that try to find some tools and then automate and use it. It saves up a lot of time. You need eight hours of time. So how are you going to multiply? Using this automation is going to be very good for you. Basically, it's time zero if you already put some time to set it up. Right? For program of the Sorry? For program of the Yeah, that's better. That's even better. Yeah, that's when, when we are doing a WordPress website, we have a list of plugins that we just run a big installation and we copy like all those uh, standards are uh, customization only you put in. Uh, okay? So you, you, maybe what you can do is uh, a good case practice is, is that you can use Google Drive, put maybe put all your things and, and something, put everything inside so your team can access it. And then, uh, example, this is for social media. If you're running a social media, you want to post a video or post a content. The content maker should just put every content in, in a folder. So once the content has been posted or has it has been scheduled, the guy who do the marketing on social media, they should grab the file and put it in the folder. Okay. Upload that, upload that, upload that stuff. So this will create a clear communication between the team. Oh, I already posted it. Uh, no, you didn't post it. Oh, I already moved the file. I said, oh, okay. It's a buffer. A buffer, you can use automation. Yeah, buffer. I put soup as well. Okay. So social media, you can use all this kind of tool. Uh, next. Okay. What's your thing? I mean, a lot of people are quite interested in how, how to do budget. A lot of freelancers, they, they, they only they only calculate for this one, usually. So your hourly rate usually only for project work or project management. You don't do much for customer service, sales marketing. Actually, all these are your costs. I'm not asking you guys to raise your price, but this is what you should take in as consideration when you're doing freelancing. You might be driving to from mainland to, to island or from island to mainland just to meet client. You might be traveling to KL, Johor, anywhere to meet client. So you should actually put, put in a cost. But I, I know a lot of uh, Malaysian bosses, they don't, don't like to see this. Oh, charge me flight ticket. That guy didn't charge me flight ticket. Of course, you don't put it up there, but you put it in the cost. Right? Put it in the cost and then you add a markup. Later, uh, share to me how, how I should be good pricing all that. Uh, yeah, how, how I actually give a budget now. So customer service is very important because you need to deal with a client. If they call you 2 a.m. The cost for your no psychology, your no sleep and stuff, you should charge them. Now. Right? Okay. <laughs> I scared this video after go out, a lot of people will kill me. <laughs> okay, sales, if you have someone who is doing sales for you or, or, or those who are doing better for you, you should give them a commission now. Or you're doing sales yourself now. Right? Uh, market rate is around, should I say this? Like, okay, like 5 to 10 percent. Okay. Depends. Like, some will go on up to 20 percent. Depends on the project size. Like, if the project size is bigger, you give lesser. Like, the amount, amount bigger, 100,000, you give 5 percent or 1 percent. Right? And then if it's a uh, 1,000, you give like, like 20 percent. Like, how much? 500. 500. 500. 500. 500. 500. Okay, bad man, sorry. <laughs> and then project management. Right? This project management, you have in, uh, maybe you are buying those kind of Kanban bots, uh, this kind of tools like Trello, something you use premium one, then try to return from charges inside. Uh, right? Of course, you don't charge them like one year. Uh, you're, you're dealing with them for how many months and you put in a cost. Uh, okay? For them, work designing, uh, doing copywriting, doing coding. And this I'll uh, share to you later how you try to price for your work. And then uh, outsourcing. Uh, if you're like me, I, I'm using uh, outsourced freelancers. Okay, my team are not doing it, so you should. And the cost itself as well. And then support. Some, some of us we charge the support is after the work has been done. Right? And then maintenance of server, right? Update patches and stuff. Especially WordPress, I uh, always have plug in updates and stuff. Then my partner, uh, if you put auto updates, uh, I'll confirm your issue. Try to uh, try do auto updates. Uh. Try, uh, try automation. Uh. Try, uh. <laughs> so my automation is I hire someone else to do the thing. Uh. So I automate up uh, and the guy do it manually. Uh. Okay, so last week we were cost to I delete this with icon, ma, the coding space, ma, right? Uh, your house, ma, you can pay your mom, ma, you can put it in the house, ma, right? 
okay, food and stuff, uh, accommodation, you can travel look, and and hotel look. Remember to put this in. And, 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 and I think there's uh, even more. Uh, uh, try to think of, think further before you actually go to the client. Right? So if you are experienced like us like already, we know what we need to charge. Right? So we have no problem with that. But if you are really new, or you only do like one or two projects only, then you should take, actually consider this. Uh, but Malaysian client, they don't like to include this kind of thing inside the quotation. So don't show it, just put everything in the project book. Okay? So, okay, this is pricing model. Actually, this will be my last slide. Okay, I will try to... How, how much time I have? Huh? Okay, three minutes. Huh? More than that. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have fixed rate, we have hourly, hourly rate, we have a container contract, container contract, and uh, lastly is the profit sharing. I guess this one is the Malaysian Kind of like the most one, profit sharing. <laughs> the second, fixed rate. So usually you go for fixed rate first. Why? Because uh, because they know what is their cost already. If you tell them uh, you're using a uh, cup, you're using Amazon S3, oh, how much? I don't know. This is estimated on this much. Well. You don't like it, one. I also don't like it. If do you like it? You want like to like because if you're using a credit card, you lock it inside. What well, suddenly one thousand dollar using Google Pay and stuff? Die up, right? So try to use a fixed rate uh, stuff. But some of the project that we are using uh, the third party services like CDN la, store storage and, and server and stuff, we build on the client directly on the product. <coughs> it's too too has too much hassle la. Why don't you want to earn like fifty ringgit, hundred ringgit, back out and, and every monthly the monthly server and just get yeah, that cut, right? Because why? Because it will be more transparent to them. Right? This will be considered as happy cost. You are using that much of server, but you, you have a lot of visitors, you make money. If you are not making money, that means you a problem with your business model. It's not my issue anymore. Right? So, what, how you can uh, do a fixture is that the cost of, like what I put just now, this is your cost of. Right? Plus the estimated hours, hours of work, and plus the margin. Uh, and the margin for your hour. So, this is how you do okay. The pros of this is that kind of like it, it's easier to close with this model. I usually close with a fixed rate model, okay. And then um, the cons of it is that what if the project delay, you cannot charge an additional hour for it. So this one you have to be very very experienced to use this model. So maybe at first try to charge a little bit lower, but the time will go longer, and then you use, use the fixed rate. And the hourly rate usually will be you know, non Malaysian, non Malaysian like it. Malaysian don't like it. You tell them, I'm 50 ringgit an hour. No one will pay you an hour. They will ask you, what if uh, you purposely work more? No, I'm professional, I don't do that. I think typical Chinese. Maybe. Yeah, you're right. Asian, 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 Chinese. Yeah, Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. They, they will ask you, what, what if you purposely delay the work? Right? They won't like this kind of model. So, why you can apply on this is probably uh, those which will always need your support. Then you just fix the support for them. I say one hour is like this. Okay, this is how much I'm going to charge. Okay, and then this is the estimated hour for this one. But again, it's almost same like fixed rate because they will, they will tell you that what if you need more time. But what if you need more time, you can use this. Okay, if together with the fixed rate model, how you do it is that when they want something extra, like additional function, you actually just and stuff, you can charge. You can charge this. You can charge extra hourly rate on this. But it will be something like fixed rate. Because Malaysian kind they don't do like this, but for overseas client, they do like this. Right? And then uh, the next one, this, this one is the one that I like the most retainer for them. Which means you retain with them. Which means you do support for them. Like monthly, okay, website, how much maintenance you're going to cost me every single month. So maybe you can charge them 200, 500, it depends on your rate and the service that you do. If those that just they don't want to do a backup, just one, one two hundred, enough lah. Don't do much work, lah. Right, but it's consistent, lah. So if if the server and thing don't update, then it's not going to work, lah. Right, if the patches and stuff, you have to update, you have to work, lah. Okay, you build the hours on them, and then especially those that uh, you have, like, especially e-commerce website. Some of my clients they don't touch computer, lah. I'm now managing everything for them. Only orders they do themselves. <laughs> right, so those that upload for them, I think I do for them. I charge them. Some I even charge two, three thousand. They have 100 SKU a month. Shopify and Google 
So, so you have, we have to do, do it for them, we have to help them upload one by one. This kind of uh, content management we have to do, so you charge more. So it, it depends on, okay? And then the last one, this one I like as well, uh, profit sharing. But it depends on, uh, profit sharing is you say or they say. One question. Yeah. If they say, they define the terms and conditions. How much that you will trust them that uh, these are the profit that they are making and have a, 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 a some small cut. So yeah. on, on profit sharing model? Yeah, on profit sharing. Okay, so sorry, what 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 you mean? You mean you mean this is how how much yeah. they will make? Yeah, okay. how much the client make and, and then the, and then you have a one cut of of, of it and, and perhaps they say maybe if we 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 know that we get three million out of that, but I told you it's only one million, so okay. How do you look at it? You mean you mean uh, they, they they said you will get uh, three million? Yeah. Okay. They earn three million. Oh, then three million. Let's say you're going to get ten percent, lah. Okay. Yeah. So it's three hundred thousand, lah. Right. But this is they they will tell you it's one million only. So how do they know? It's one million only. So so uh, first of all, you have to think about one thing: Are these Sanjay Bharat or just partnership kind of company? Of course, they must be Sanjay Bharat, lah. Better, lah. Then you directly get what you get share, lah. But share got a lot, a lot of type one or technical and those, those kind of share. You need to know which type of share. I'm not the best person to, to teach you about shares and company structures. But the best thing that uh, you, you can do is that you have to ask them what, what, how, how you dilute the share to you. Right? And then maybe it's on the sales part and stuff. If you're one of the directors or one of the shareholders, you can actually see the annual report. You should actually see the annual report. So if they, if they bluff you, you will know. Right? Yes? <clears throat> Are you talking about when they give you equity in addition to yes. cash? Yes. As opposed to a cash yes. payment, yes. which is a percentage of profit? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I see. That, that's, that's actually, people are very creative uh, when they come to profit sharing. Sorry. They, when, when they come to profit sharing, because they want you, man, they have the talent. Man. So, okay, from, from a perspective of client, what, what are the things that clients are worried about? What, what's their anxiety? Maybe you are unable to deliver. Okay, maybe they, you, you, you are able to deliver, right? This is the first thing that, that is in them. Okay, what if you already deliver? Are you going to give support? Second thing. The third thing is that, what if you deliver? Sorry, and able to give the support. Sorry? And deliver and able to support. And what if uh, there are some uh, Unhealthy approach from the company. Define unhealthy approach. <laughs> uh, unhealthy approach. For example, uh, the company is all up to cheat you to buy from the company. Okay. Okay. So, so okay. You deliver and then you're unable to solve. This one is. Okay, this is from the perspective. Let me finish first. Huh? So, what if you deliver plus no need support? Eh? Okay. Understand? Huh? That means there's something that's already done and then no need support. Eh? Or they find someone else to support it, you don't need to do the role really. So, first thing to them is that if you cannot deliver, confirm you get zero. Right? This is what they thought of. Right? Suddenly, is that what if you deliver, you only can give partial support, which they don't like it, of course you get zero as well. This is how they thought. This is how they thought. Impossible you, you even get one cent from them if you're unable to support. You blame really Of course, maybe you get a partial payment or deposit already, then you save, but of course, always take money first. Right? And then, lastly, if you deliver and they, they don't support, they, they don't need your support, they will, they, they will talk to you as this is usually happening with VC. This is what, what I always see in startup that oh, we have our own tech team to replace you. Or oh, this one already, we can use it, we don't need to update and stuff. I can get someone cheaper to do it. I don't need, I don't need a CTO. But a lot, of, a lot of companies are doing this. Be frank, I, I know a few they are doing this. So this is something which is, in the end, you get zero as well. So the best thing is get, always get a contract. Always get a contract on profit sharing. But like I said, when someone is offering you a profit sharing kind of contract, it's you say or they say. You say. Don't listen to what they say. Because you have to protect yourself first. That's the thing you have to consider first. If you think this project is valuable, you want to invest your time in it, go for it. This is the best approach. Because you are the one making the decision. Even if they depot you or you have paid, you won't blame, blame others, man. This one, hey, come on, do profit sharing, blah, 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 blah. I do profit sharing with my client. How I see is I evaluate the product. If this is good, 
I do free website for you, free maintenance for you. Of course, for your sales, I take a cut. I know much because I got everything in my hand. Yeah. It's interesting how much of this uh, revolves around trust. <laughs> um, and um, uh, when I hear think about the profit sharing, I mean, I have an accounting degree. There are so many ways you can like reduce your profit. You know, you you can expense stuff that you don't. You know, so it's all about trust, man. And for, for that reason, like I probably wouldn't go near something that you know, unless unless the cash I was getting was yes. worth it. Yes. I probably wouldn't go near it um, unless. If you can build up a trust relationship over time, and that's why that's why by the way community is so important. You know, technical community, business community. Um, I, I really try to get out there and, and meet people and get to know them over the years and get to know me and stuff. And, yeah. um, can't say this paid off that great for me yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm still working on it. Okay, good. So, so uh, again, back to your question just now, you said that okay, this is from your perspective. Huh? So, what you work is that you able to deliver, you able to give support, right? Okay, what, what else? Are, sorry. Deliver and support. Okay. Okay, la, that means you're able to deliver and you're able to support. Correct. So of course you have to you have to get la. So again you have to get a contract. Of course you have to get, get a contract. But then when this happened, like what he said just now, it's all about trust. But you should always get a contract. So how I usually like I said evaluate the property sharing, first thing when it comes to myself, I say, I don't want to say, what you say, I'm not interested, I'm not interested in what I want, okay, first thing first then, okay, I will see whether they have value or not, whether this can sell or not, who, 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 who is the one who's doing the marketing, it's so important, because when I do profit sharing, usually what I do is that I will, I will support this tech and marketing together, they are the one who do the product, I will get a cut every time, I, 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 I won't do those kind of profit sharing is until end of the year you have a company report, this is your profit, no I won't. Every single sale I will get a cut from it. This is safer, no? right? Yep. I have a question. Um, I'm in the process of negotiating with a potential client right now. We're going back and forth about the contract. I'm just kind of curious, I, I, I only know about how it works in America, but how often do people like contractors push back against clients and say, here's the contract, sign it and we'll start working? You know, because um, I think most people, like, they'll just say, oh, well, they got the contract, so I have to sign it, you know. But I, I read the contracts and I push back and I say, well, wait a minute, you know, there's yep. this and this and this. Do other people do that too? Yeah, some, some cases you might meet some SD company and uh, they will sign, agree, and after that, they, they everything, uh, handshake, agree. But the next point, the drawback contract, you know, is you do this business, so can you lower down the price? They, they will bash you up, they will ask you to go down your price. That happens all the time in Malaysia. So you, you can't be very weak enough to be adamant enough, to be strong enough, and tell them no, no, this kind of approach we cannot accept. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, change of saying. They will come into the they are the walls of on their advantage. <coughs> Rather than giving to all the all the books and so on, so they are very very cunning in a way. So in, in this particular dealing with this business over in Asia, I mean some bad companies do happen. So you you find the ones. It's like a good position, Sorry, I don't know what. Don't know what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, seriously, I don't. As I go. Man, don't, 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 okay, fine. I don't want to come up with racist comment. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, another idea would be try to always do something when you want to do profit sharing. Do the one, something that you have control. Okay, maybe maybe the first thing that they, 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 they already pay, pay a fixed rate. La. You have completed a project, la. they need your support. La. This is the safest way. La. Every month you have income, la. you do support. La. The support income is from profit sharing. La. This is still better than getting nothing. But always like uh, what you say just now, like push back contract to them, or you can redo the contract to them. It's not it's not expensive uh, to get a lawyer to, to, to figure out the contract. If it's something big, it's worth it. But if it's not something big, then don't do it. Uh. Wanna force yourself, it's, it's, it's not big one. So so what a project that I'm, I'm currently doing, which is uh, I'm selling actually the copy to what? <laughs> I'm doing marketing and stuff for, for my client. Another one which I'm trying to do, which is uh, I think it's a 
Chinese pencil or something. Right? So I, I know my stuff, right? so you have to know your stuff in order to do project. If not, kindly avoid project sharing. Really. Yeah. As a freelancer, one of the biggest issues for me is the timing of payments. Like uh, yeah. if the contract says I can issue an invoice at the end of the month and then they have 30 days to pay, if this is a startup company, they might have closed by that time, you know? So I think that's uh, another really important aspect of the contract. And to me, there's, there's way more than just the rate, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. Mm. The, the duration of the uh, payment day is important for every month end, or you get uh, each, each and every phase of completion and you will get your payment. Uh, what, what is your condition? Well, my I'm extremely risk averse, which is probably why I'm not working most of the time. But um, uh, I, I want either prepayment or, um, and I make it easy, you know, like I'll issue a PayPal invoice so they can pay with a credit card if they want. Prepayment, you know? 50% down on your order, and you start the project, and another uh, 50% of the payment will come after you end the project. No, not after or I end the project. Not that it's time-based, it's hourly rate, um, so like it might be like, um, uh, I will bill you at the end of each week and you have three days to pay me. And for that, for that, I'm giving you this discount. If you don't pay me in three days, then it's the regular rate, which is higher, you know? Um, frequent payment, and, and I, with big established companies, it might not be that big a deal. But if you're dealing with some party that you haven't known before, you haven't trusted, then- Then payment 2% incur charges for interest rates. Yeah, that happened to me once. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. again, this kind of thing is about payment terms, right? So, uh, First thing first is that you have to balance between two things. One is called customer servicing. Another thing is called payment. Right? You have to balance between two. And then which is customer servicing. So what if you incur for example like that two percent if they let payment? Would this actually affect your relationship with them? If they are a potential retainer client, then you don't charge that. But if they shitty people then you should charge as well. So like I said, why you need a gun charge? Well, you need a gun chart. You should include one payment date. Do you do that? You guys do that? That's why you guys don't do gun chart. Huh? Gun chart can include payment date as well. Huh? Because gun chart is what? It's transparent. If I deliver on this date and you don't pay on this date, you charge huh? 50% also 10 extra, 2%, 5%. That's how you charge. Huh? Well, that's, why you, that's why you need gun chart, black and white, contract, everything you put it inside. This is what you do. Sorry? Pay by choices. Phase, phase, uh, phase one. Ah, phase one. So you have, phase have phase to get the date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are the one with, with late delivery, should you give a discount? Yes, yes. I'm careful. So it depends, uh, depends on how, how depends on you are. I don't know whether I should say this or not. So normally, in the big corporate, actually, the company will bear the cost of paying to the client. It's, it's very deep. Very tedious and it's very, I mean, damaging. Mm. A lot of times they will manage and, and they screen through all the, the, the timeline and the budget must fall in place. They will let yep. your timeline go off. If you are if you're dealing with corporate, you have to have payment terms. You have to follow what? Yes. Usually you have to follow, but of course, you have to let go. You cannot be, say 100%, then you just follow them. And don't be, when they cannot, they can't be the same one. Big, big corporate. I give you the project, I give yeah. you discount no. 10 million for me and on top of that I'll give, I'll give you another business that you have to buy now, my, uh, my, my uh, palm oil so that we have a, yeah. a, a smooth transaction for yes. this particular business. This is how we do it. So uh, one, one story I heard from my friend uh, which is quite a sad story. They did it with a corporate. I don't know the name who is a corporate. They done marketing for them and they owe them like around 4 million, owe this company for around 4 million, and then they don't pay until now. And then my friend go and ask the manager, hey, why is you still don't pay? Because they're a good friend, they tell me, my boss is actually waiting you for bankrupt on this. They don't plan to pay you for it. There's this type of corporate information as well. So be careful. <laughs> be careful. And right? they can be pursued legally for that money? They just break your payment because of some, some nasty reasons. So so always be careful. Like, pay, payment, like, like I said, Control your profile, I say control your group is that you don't need to accept every single client. If you are not capable enough to have that kind of six months, six months, six months, twelve months kind of cash flow in your company, that 
you will be able to sustain yourself. Don't do that. Do SME lah. I also targeting SME a lot. Lah. Most of my clients are SME. Only this year I try to go into corporate. But when I go into corporate, I go in with a partner, not going in with myself. They already <coughs> have a good relationship with the corporate already. So you go in like that. You don't directly go in. You with a profile, you go in. You know what's this? For example, with certain duration, I did not get your payment. My software will have some disruption. So, I say, bye bye. I say, bye bye. Yeah, try to. If you can do that, then do that. Lah. But try, try to avoid until that kind of stage. Lah. Yeah, try to avoid until that kind of stage. Lah. You gotta put one time bomb inside. Yeah. To, to, to say bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it, I think, I think payment terms is get back to the client like corporate or get back to SMB. Whether they follow your payment term or you follow their payment. Usually corporate you have to follow their payment term. And then if they're really good corporate, you clear payment you have to ask uh, some of your vendors and stuff. Okay, uh, are you getting payment? You're getting payment, then this is a good one, then you can go and do it. If they have some bad reputation, then try to avoid. But uh, usually SMB, SMB will pay. Lah. But I have an SMB not paying or owe me a lot of money as well. Right? Yeah, you, 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 you can actually do that. Uh, they have, again, they have a lot of reason. reason. It's not worth it for you to sue them for case over $50,000. It's not worth it. Uh, unless it's, it's million, then you sue them. Uh, right? Why worth your time? Because your time is to get the right client and you charge them. As long as maybe one sue, it can drag up until yeah. 8 years. Yeah. Yes. 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 But as early as it can close within 5 years, it's kind of like too lengthy. So try, try my, my suggestion is that try to go for fixed rate plus hourly rate plus retainer. This will always come with risk. Of course, this rate will have risk as well. But all, your aim is from fixed rate go to retainer contract. That's the best thing. But you can charge them renewal like ten thousand a year is enough. You get three clients, you got thirty k already a year. So plus a active project that you keep taking in, taking in, taking in. Have the kind of passion sustain you with Okay, so I, I, I believe you guys have a pending question, if not less engaged, I think. Because I'm actually hiring, so I'm hiring intern, I want to get freelancer, and partner. So if you are doing video shooting, you do copywriting, you do design, you do coding, programming, anything, less at the top. I won't I won't tipu you guys funny, okay. This is recorded, I won't tipu one. Okay, what you usually do is that we will uh, give you a fixed rate. You, you discuss a fixed rate with you, if you're happy with that, then you do with it. And then if you're performing good, which which means you actually want you to do three projects. Because if you got profit, I will give you bonus. If not, you can ask my ask my programmer. <laughs> you can ask my freelan my freelancer that actually got bonus during Chinese New Year. If you want to have it during Christmas, it's fine. <laughs> right? So so actually it depends on, on how you want to work with If you want to do the profit sharing basis as well, we can discuss. But I would prefer to go for a fixed rate and then if you're making money, let's go for a bonus and maybe a company trip. Because I want to treat freelancers like brothers. Like. Because I, I don't want to manage people. If you can manage yourself, you have your own team, I like it happy. Managing more than 10 people is very, very hard. Yes. So, yes, so please get my number, talk to me later. I'm not, although tomorrow I'm going to get out at 4 a.m. So just talk to me and have some time because I need people. Okay? So that's all. Thank you. Thank you.
Jump to Ruby. Okay, good. More. Okay. So, uh, attendance. So, please help to time into attendance by the end of the event. Uh, thank you for being here and see you in the next meetup. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.